Good morning, Moraine Valley Church. I'm excited. I've been waiting for this morning to share this message. It's been a life changer for me. I pray it'll be a life changer for you. So I, I want to open in prayer this morning and just ask God to do something I can't do. <laughs> and that's transform you and me at the core of our beings in light of what his word has to say. So would you pray with me this morning? Father, I, I have to admit, I'm very excited to share this because it was life transforming for me. I've never been the same since you taught me these lessons. And Lord, I just pray this morning that your Holy Spirit would fill this place. God, he would do things that only God can do. He would change us at the core of our being. He would change the way we think. He would change the decisions we make. He would change the way we pray, the way we talk. So Lord, I just give this morning to you, declaring that I have zero capacity to do anything in my own life, let alone others, to make lasting changes. So I want to trust you, Lord, that your spirit this morning would exalt Jesus because of what he did on the cross and because of what he purchased for us, we can enjoy those gifts today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Young people, I hope in particular that God will uh, grab your hearts with these lessons today. Man, if you guys can grab these things at a young age, um, how way ahead of the rest of us you'll be as you walk through life. Many of you know my friend Mike Stabile. I was talking, we went out and visited him recently in Cincinnati. And he has a consulting company. He, he kind of coaches executives. And he calls it Future Now. So I said, Mike, why, why do you call your consulting firm Future Now? He said, the reason is this. Because your future starts right now. And it all has to do with the way you think. He said, every thought matters. Think about that. Every thought matters. And I, I got to tell you what, guys, I'm concerned because of how sloppy I was in the past with my thinking and how sloppy I know other believers are and never take thought of the thousands of thoughts that come through our mind every day. But the reality is, is that every thought matters matters. Then he said this, the greatest asset that you have to growing is your mind. But the greatest, ass, uh, the greatest hindrance you have to growing is your mind as well. He, this, I was like, wow. <laughs> it's so true. And as he shared that, I couldn't help but think of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Many of you know this passage. It, it, it's written in the context of spiritual warfare. And he says this, we're destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we're taking every, every, every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Guys, we are destroying speculations, every lofty thing raised up against what we know to be true because of this book where God has revealed his heart, his mind, his work, who he is, what he's done. And what we're doing is we're bringing every thought captive to the obedience of God in his word, his son, Jesus Christ. You know what? We need to realize that a key battlefield in our walk with Jesus, in our war with Satan, is our mind. And if God gives us grace, and if today, your future starts today, with the way you respond to this message, but more importantly, the way you respond to the thoughts that go through your mind, if you win this battle of your mind, you start the war today, it will make a difference in your life, not only today, but throughout the rest of your life. 
I want you to take a thought. Just think with me for a second. Think, think of a circumstance you went through recently. Something that was difficult. Maybe it's a personal uh, issue. Maybe it's a circumstantial thing. Maybe it's a relational thing. And you went through something that was difficult. Think about that for a moment. Get, get, get that in your mind. You got one? Now, this is my question. How did you label that? How did you label that experience? Do you say, this is bad? This is destructive? This is unfair? This is hurtful? This is bigger than I can handle? I'm hopeless before this. I'm helpless before this. It'll never change. I hate this, etc. The list goes on and on. We have labels that we give to our experiences. And you need to know this. Your experience of that event that you just thought about is largely dictated by the way you label it. Think about that. Because right now you've got a paradigm that you have locked that experience into, and now you're looking at it through that label that you've given. You say, this is bad. This is hurtful. This is unfair. This is too big. We go on and on. And I love what Charles Swindoll said years ago. I want to put this up for those who have never seen this before. Many of you have, but this is so true. The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude, to me, is more important than facts. It is more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than success, than what other people think or say or do. It's more important than appearances, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, a home, a person. The remarkable thing is we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in certain ways. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing that we can do is play the one string we have, and that is our attitude. I'm convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. And so it is with you, we are in charge of our attitudes. Guys, if you forget everything else, if you will recognize the reality that life is really about 10% of what happens to us, what's surrounding us, what we're encountering, the things that are going on. The big piece of our life and the determiner of that is the 90% of how we react to what's going on. Just as a little side note, I mean, you can either react by being a, a, a therm thermometer, which means that when the temperature rises, the thermometer rises, right? And so you let the circumstances, you let the people, you let the personal problem, it all of a sudden is acting up. So now I act up, and I rise up with it. And so my life reflects the circumstances around, and so I react like that. Or you can be a thermostat that's not controlled by the circumstances, the problem, or the people, but is controlled by the Spirit of God. You see the difference? And guess what a thermostat does? It controls the temperature of the room. It changes the temperature of the room. It changes what goes on. And so we have an opportunity with every situation we run into to either be a thermometer that reacts and that whole thing gets bigger and bigger because now I'm getting all crazy about it in my thoughts or I can be a thermometer that by means of the Holy Spirit and the truth of God's word that whole thing can look totally different. I can put a whole new label on that experience. Think with me for a second about that experience that you just chose that was a little bit difficult for you to go through. What would have happened in that same experience, and maybe some of you did this, and so I'm not assuming everybody didn't, but what would happen 
If you took that same experience and you brought every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus in that experience. What if you took the situation and thought to yourself, God is in control of this, isn't he? He really is. <laughs> so evidently God allowed this to come into my life. God is in control of the circumstances of my life. And you know what? God has the power to change it. If he wanted to, at this very moment, God could speak a word into it and change the whole thing. He could send an angel and solve the whole problem. And he may. But if he doesn't, it's because he's in control and he's got a different purpose for what he's trying to do. We need to remember not only is he in control of my life around me and the circumstances that are happening, not only does he have power to prevent that from happening or change it once it happens, God is here right now with me in that circumstance. And he lives in me. And guess what? Let me give you a fourth thing to throw into your thinking. He loves you. He wants to bless you. Remember in Matthew 6, the birds of the air, you know, they, they don't build big barns and store things away, and, and they're, they're not living full of anxiety and fear about where their next meal's coming from. He says, why are you, old man, so worried? Don't you realize your heavenly Father knows you need this, and you're of greater value to him than that sparrow that's only worth a couple cents? Guys, what if we really thought that way? Wouldn't that change the way we face the things that go on in our lives? What would happen if we added to that thinking, Romans 8, 28 and 29, that says that God is not only in control of every circumstance, but he's using every one of those circumstances to make me more like Jesus. And the more I am like Jesus, that can only be a good thing for those around me. And what if we throw into the mix James 1 where he talks about trials? And he says he's using these trials to test your faith to see if you're going to trust him or run to your human resources to do this. And when you trust him, he's going to actually use this trial to grow you up and make you bigger and better and stronger in Jesus. And what do we throw into the mix in Corinthians where he talks about the fact that our weaknesses, the insults, the persecution, the distresses that we face in life when we will face them and be honest with them and boast about my weakness in the face of them rather than trying to get big enough to overcome and say, God, this is bigger than me, but it's not bigger than you. You know what the scripture says? Then the power of Jesus enters into that circumstance. So think with me. If every thought matters, and the greatest asset you have to your growth, the key battlefield that Satan's trying to take us down on is our mind. If we face those situations we just took in those different, different ways, they change totally the way we react to it. Like Swindoll said, you know, the real story of life is not what's happening to us. It's the way we react to it. And that's the one thing we have control over by means of the Spirit of God. So guys, that, that's so important because today I want you to see something. I want you to know that you are spiritually richer than you ever realized. And I want you to know that you can have a future that's brighter than you ever thought if you're willing to take every, every, every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus and see yourself the way that God sees you. If you do those two, guys, life is radically going to change for you. So let me start recognizing where you're richer than you think. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. We're in a series on blessings. You're going to find out you're way more blessed 
than you ever realized. And that's what we're going to see first thing this morning. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. I want to make sure you're there because I want you to see the text for yourself. If you don't have a Bible, we haven't provided for you in the racks underneath. Look on your phone. Look on with somebody next to you. You need to see God's word this morning because your encouragement isn't going to come from Pat's words, but from God's words. And I want you to watch for four things as I read Ephesians, just one verse. I want you to know what kind of blessings are these? Through whom did we get these blessings? How many blessings are there? And when will you get these blessings? So watch for that as I read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. You know, those who were here the first week, you see three of the four kinds of blessings we talked about. The blessed, that means to exalt and praise and thank God for a benefit he gave us. Blessed, when he talks about that uh, in the second one we use, is who has blessed us, God has given us a benefit that has given us a well-being to our life and a happiness and a deep down sense of completeness and composure. And the third one is with every spiritual blessing, that's the actual benefit that God is pouring down on the person that makes them on the inside feel the sense of well-being and happiness because of what God has done, which causes their heart to raise up to God and say, blessed be the Lord Jesus Christ and the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for what he's done. We see three of the four blessings in this passage. But I want you to note, first of all, what kind of blessing does he say this is in this verse? I'll try again. I'm going to listen real close today. You guys know how bad I am at hearing in this auditorium. What kind of blessings does he say in Ephesians 1 that we have? Spiritual blessings. We learned in Romans 8, remember? The spirit is that part of us that's the deepest part of who we are. It's the core of who we are. It drives everything in our lives. It's the control room of our lives. It's the place where the Spirit of Christ has come in and joined with us as one. It's the core of our being. It's the innermost part of who we are that controls everything else. And it's at that level and that kind of blessings that God has given us. Now look in this passage again. Through whom did we get these blessings? Jesus Christ. You know what, guys? These gifts we're talking about in this passage were purchased by Jesus with his blood. He shed his blood for us to buy these gifts that we're going to talk about this morning. He was buried. He raised again. He was risen again. He ascended to the right hand of the Father. Jesus is the one through whom these blessings are given. If you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus. What we're talking about this morning is really not for you. If you haven't come to that place to recognize that you stand separated from God and your only hope ever of coming in a relationship with him is not by you doing something, but by trusting what he did for you. It's through Jesus that all these blessings come. And I just want to encourage you, if you're here this morning and you say, I'm not totally sure if I know Jesus, or maybe you're here today and you say, I know I don't know Jesus. I'm going to give you a personal invitation. Come to me afterwards. Write your name on a piece of paper with your phone number. I would love to set up a personal meeting with you to help you understand how you can come into a relationship with Jesus Christ and benefit from the things we're talking about. Now, with a little more energy and volume and more participation... How many spiritual blessings is he talking about here? 
what we see in the passage. Wow, outstanding. Every, every spiritual blessing. Does that mean are there any spiritual blessings we don't have? Every, every spiritual blessing. Everything God has designed for you in the spiritual realm, in the heavenlies, we're not going to go there this morning, but in that spiritual realm, God has already given to you and blessed you at the core of your being with. Now, one last question. When do we get those blessings? Look back at the text. A little louder. Now. Matter of fact, maybe before now. Because whenever you trusted Jesus at that moment, because look at back what the text says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed, past tense, us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. You already have every blessing spiritually that God designs for you. There's no more to get. No more to seek. No more special meetings to go to. No more special seminars are going to give me some new insight on some spiritual blessing that I'm somehow missing. And if I just go there, that somehow I'll get that. But rather, our heart needs to be the disposition of Paul. Blessed be. That's what we talk about next week. It's that part of blessing that goes upward because of everything that God has poured downward into me. My heart is so full, I can't help but turn back up and say, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's praising, it's thanking, it's exalting God because of every blessing that he's already given to us. So what are these blessings? That's really what Ephesians 1, the rest, spells out for us, and really the rest of the New Testament, because he talks about these blessings we have in Christ, and uh, the whole New Testament is unfolding to us all the things we have in Jesus Christ. But right here, if you look in verse 4, I'm not going to read all these verses, I'll encourage you to look back at them later. In verse 4, we're going to find out one of these blessings is he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. We were chosen by God. You know, when you came to Jesus, it wasn't the smartest thing. I hear people say, the smartest thing I ever did was trust Jesus. No, it's the most gracious gift you ever received. You didn't choose Jesus. Jesus chose you. And God, through his spirit, worked in time to bring you to trust in his son. You were chosen by God. You were predestined to adoption as sons, verse 5 says. You've been adopted by God. This is an unbelievable blessing because those who've been adopted understand, all of a sudden, I get to take on that family's name and I get all the rights that family has and I get all the possessions that family has. And so when we were adopted, because God predetermined that those he chose would be placed in his family and get all the rights that go along with that. And then you go on down in verse 9. I'm sorry, verse 7. In him we have redemption. You know what that means? That means this. Redemption is, is that idea of someone who's caught in slavery that has been set free. Somebody paid the price to get them out of the slave market. And we've been redeemed Jesus has paid the price to get you and me out of the slave market of Satan and out of the slave market of sin to walk as free men and women in Jesus Christ. Then he says later in that verse, forgiveness of our trespasses, the debt we owed God has been paid off. A debt we could never pay for ourselves, Jesus paid for us, we have been forgiven, it's been written off. Verse 9, he's, no, he's made known to us the mystery of his will. You know what, God, what God's doing in this world, and you see in the next verse what he's doing in this world and in the future is all centered around Jesus. 
We as believers, a gift that God has given to us, one of the blessings is we know what God's doing. And we know what God's going to do. And we understand what God has done. And we see the world from a whole different perspective because one of the blessings that God has given to us, one of the benefits he's given to us through the supernatural book, the Bible, is we get to know what God is doing. And then he goes down further in verse 11, and he says, we've obtained an inheritance. You know, guys, th this is the amazing thing. We studied this in Romans. My name was put on the will with Jesus. Everything that God the Father has committed to his son, he's committed to me. That's why I'm going to reign with Jesus in the kingdom. He shares his glory with us. The list goes on and on, but because we are in Christ and one of the blessings God's given us, he's given us an inheritance. What Jesus has, I have. I share with him by God's grace. Then he goes down in verse 13, and he says, you were sealed in him with a Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. Sealed. You know what it means? God has put the Holy Spirit inside of you and me. That becomes the seal. That becomes the guarantee. That becomes the, the promise that says, you know what, you're one of my children, and I'm going to guarantee it that you make it to my future kingdom and into eternity because the Holy Spirit is the seal that's going to keep you and guard you until that time. These are just some of the blessings. As you read in the New Testament, you walk all the way through it, you see all kinds of things that the New Testament talks about that we have in Jesus. Those that have a bulletin, good reason to grab a bulletin every week, we have a very important flyer inside here for you. I want you to take a look at it. This can be life-changing. What, what I, um, I'm going to share with you, I have had times I've been in tense spiritual warfare. My mind just can't get under control. I mean, I'm to the point I just can't think straight, and I'll get down on my knees, and one by one I'll start to praise my way through these truths of what God has given to me in Christ. I only get halfway down the front page. That battle has turned into a time of joy and peace in Jesus. Because when you realize what God has given you, Let's take a look. There, there's two sides here. One side, talk about blessings we already have because we are in Christ. The other one is who you have already become. You understand the difference? Who you become. This is who you are now. You have been changed. You're a new creature. This defines who you are. Let's start with that side. Then we'll go to what you have, what gifts he's given to this new person that you are. Blessings, uh, who you have already become because of God's grace. Do you know you're the salt of the earth? You're the light of the world. Talked about that last week. We're God's instrument to bring his blessing to the world around. You, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. You're a channel of Christ's life, a branch chosen to bear his fruit. You're the person whom Jesus lives his life through right now in this world. You're Christ's friend. Friend. You're not just his servant. <laughs> you know, we certainly respect God and the master and the lordship of Jesus, and we talk about ourselves as his servants, but you know what? We're his friend. Jesus looks at us as his friend. We're dead to sin. The realm of sin has totally been broken in our lives. We no longer live in that realm. We're alive to God. We're in a new realm that we're no longer under the control of sin, but now we live a life that's alive to God. We're a slave to rights. At the core of your being, I say, boy, Pat, but it doesn't seem like it. I don't walk like this. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the reality is in your inner being, your bent is towards righteousness and you are a slave to righteousness rather than sin. You are a son or a, or a daughter of God. God is spiritually your father. This is good news 
for those who had a bad father experience. And those who have had that know the impact that that can have upon you as a person and the sense of what you know as you walk through life and into marriage and things like that. Relationships with the opposite sex. You know what, guys? God is your father now. And we need to learn him and begin to understand his love for us in light of the cross and what he's done for us through Jesus. It goes on and says this, we're joint heirs with Christ, where he talked about that. My name's been written on the will with Jesus. Those who had parents that died, you have brothers and sisters. You all got an equal share. The unbelievable part is we got a share with Jesus. Now, he is the firstborn, so he gets a double share, but we do get a share with Jesus in the inheritance. We, you are inseparable from Christ's love. There is nothing you can do as a child of God that can separate you from his love. Now, you may do something that you might get a spanking for, <laughs> but he'll still love you even as he spanks you. But there's nothing you can do to separate yourself from the love of God. We are one body interdependent upon one another. We're now the temple of God. We're now the ones he expresses his life through and we need one another. That's who you really are. You're the dwelling place of God's spirit and his life. You're a member of Christ's body. You're a new creation. You're an ambassador for Christ. We talked about that last week. New creation. You're, you, if before you knew Jesus, God did something down at the deepest core of your being, the control room of your life, he put that man to death. He made you a new man who is brand new. You are clothed with Christ. We talked about that last week. You're one with all other believers. You're Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promises we talked about last week. You're a saint. Believe that. Yeah, that's hard to believe. I'm a saint. St. Patrick. They should have a St. Patrick's Day, shouldn't they? I'm going to nominate March 17th as St. Patrick's Day. You're a saint. You're a saint. God already sees you as a saint. And you know what? We don't have to hold a council to decide whether you're worthy of it. God has already said you're a saint. You're God's workmanship, created to do good's work. You're the result of God's handiwork. And the purpose of that handiwork was to do good works that he has prepared for you beforehand. You're a fellow citizen with the rest of God's family. We're citizens of heaven. This one's hard for some to follow because we look at our experience, but you want to know who you really are at the core of being. You are righteous. You are holy if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. That's who you are at the core. Maybe you're walking inconsistent with that, but that's who you really are. We are light. We've been made complete. There's nothing else to find to make us complete. There's no other experience. There's no other person we need to go searching for in the world to somehow become complete. We have found completeness in Christ. You've died and your life is hidden with Christ. You've been chosen by God. You're not only God's friend, you're dearly loved by God. You're a royal priesthood. You're the people of God. You're an enemy of the devil. <laughs> Guess what? When you got all these things on, you can expect the devil's against you. You're a child of God, one who does not habitually sin. That's who you really are. And I think you can see where we're going. Guess what? What if you thought about yourself like that? We so often think about ourselves and label ourselves in light of our experience rather than the reality of who God has made us. The truest thing about you is what God says about you. Not even what you think about yourself, not what others tell you about you. The truest thing about you is what God says about you, and this is what God says. And could you imagine what your life would be like if you began to think about yourself like this? We only went halfway through the list. Look at the other side. This is what you already have because you're in Jesus. You're freed from all things that the law could not free us from. All the rules and the commandments in the Old Testament and the law, they couldn't set us free. They can manage sin and contain sin, but only Jesus can set us free from sin. 
We're redeemed. We talked about that. Free from the power of sin. We have eternal life. That's a gift God gave us. We're going to live forever and ever and ever. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. It doesn't matter what you've done. And you don't want to abuse and spit in the face of God with his goodness. But this is the fact. Jesus already took our condemnation for those of us that are believers. There's no more condemnation on us. Jesus took our condemnation. We've been set free from the principle of sin. We've been set free from the principle of death. We are sanctified. That means we're set apart for God. Grace of God was given to you. In everything, you're enriched. Wisdom is available to you. You're the righteousness of God. Future, the righteousness of God was given to you. I'm sorry, that you, you are righteous. What's been given to you is the righteousness of God as a gift. You are going to have a future resurrection. God's promises are fulfilled in Christ. God always leads us in his triumph. You say, man, it feels like I'm losing. No, the reality, the truth is God's leading us in triumph. You've got to define the goal of what winning is before you understand this verse. And so many of us have set our own labels on what winning is, and that's usually dictated in light of North Americans' culture. But when we dictate our goals in light of eternal culture, God is always leading us in his triumph in Christ. The veil is removed from our hearts. We can see the reality of Christ. We have the blessing of Abraham. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. That's what we're talking about. Chosen before the foundation. Lord. We have adopted as sons. Grace was freely and richly given to us. Our sins have been forgiven. We've obtained an inheritance. We were sealed with the Holy Spirit. We were raised up with Christ. We're seated with Christ in the heavenly places. We've been brought near to God because of the work of Christ on the cross. We can approach God with freedom and confidence. Truth is in Jesus. We've been firmly rooted in him. Our hearts have been circumcised, and we have triumph over Satan. Remember we said on the other side, you're, you're Satan's enemy. I want you to remember this one, because we're going to go to this in a second. But you already have triumphed over Satan. The grace of God is more than abundant. The grace of God is granted to us. Guys, we have been blessed with every, every, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. How many? Every. What kind? Spiritual. Through whom? Jesus. When do we have him? We got it the moment we trusted in Jesus and the Holy Spirit came in us and sealed us. At that moment, they became our possession. Now, this is the way I want to close today's message, and this is the application for today. Let me tell you, by the way, how I use this chart, how I encourage people to do it. I'd encourage you to take this home this week and look on both sides. What are the top three you struggle with the most? Believing. Top three things it says about who you are. You say, man, that, I just, I have a hard time believing that. Or the top three things you have. And then what I encourage you to do is start thanking God in the face of that lie that that's what's true of you. Look up the passage that's next to it. Read it, understand it, memorize it, meditate on it. Let the truth of God's word fill you and begin to take every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus. When that lie comes to your mind, let God's truth be what you see yourself through. It really will change everything. And I, I just want to close by sharing a story and a challenge. The story is, is I remember when God first caused me to see that I already have these blessings in Jesus rather than living my life to get them. You follow me? So many Christians, if I just get in the word more, if I just memorize more scripture, if I just get involved in the ministry, if I just go to more Bible studies, maybe if I start giving, maybe if I just pray more, you know, and so we're trying to do more thinking. If I just do all these things more, then I'll get the victory. But God used one of the darkest times in my life to teach me the lesson that I'm not a victim of Satan and my circumstances and of sin, but I'm a victor in Jesus. It was a time, it was early on in my ministry, probably second year, Kim, I, I can't remember when it was. 
I went through an intense, very long battle with myself and Satan. It, it, it was really a two-year period that this went over. It was scary. It was deep. Internally, I was full of fear. I was full of unbelief. I was full of anxiety. And I was full of lust. And this hadn't been my normal experience. I mean, I'm just like every other person. I have moments of those things, ups and downs, but it wasn't something that ever controlled me like that. It's like something broke on the inside and it just flooded into my life. I felt like Rocky in the first movie, in the first round of Apollos Creed. He said he was blocking the punches with his face. Satan was throwing punches at me and I was blocking him with my face, man. I was on the ropes. I was bent over. I was this victim trying to fight somehow to get the victory and I was losing. This is the way it felt to me inside. I felt like my soul was being raped. Raped is a strong word, but that's exactly what I felt these thoughts were forcing themselves upon me. I didn't want them. I didn't delight in them. It wasn't something I was saying, hey, I want to think more about this, or I want to... No, they, they, it was like I was being raped by these thoughts. They were forceful. They were strong. They were filling me with fear and anxiety and unbelief and lust. And I'm going, oh, man, it's just like, I can't... Oh, you know, it just, it, it, I was getting beat up. I was losing. I was convinced I was going to lose. I was going to be the next pastor to go down... And I was losing my strength and my grip. During that time, uh, there was a conference here that um, a couple pastors were holding. And, and I, I just, and they talked a little bit about spiritual warfare and the importance of if you want to win the battle for your soul, you got to first win the battle over the devil. Uh, you got to first bind the strong man before you can go in and take his goods, that kind of idea. So I asked these two guys, I said, hey guys, break time. I, can I? It was a longer break, 1.15 was lunchtime. I said, I, I hate to do this to you guys. We'll grab some, but I need to share something with you. So we went back in the office that I'm still in. I, I can still see it. I was sitting behind my desk. They were in the two chairs. And I began to share the story of what was going on inside my soul and how I was losing the battle. And they started to pray for me. And guys, God turned on a light bulb. They, they didn't pray about this particular verse. Um, it was, but what God did as they were praying and asking God to give me victory over the devil, I believe Satan was trying to take me out early in my ministry. And, and, and so as they prayed for victory here in this area of my life and seeing the intense battle I was in and the weak, weakened state I was in and how I was losing this battle, they began to pray with great authority about God's victory in my life. And God turned on a light and reminded me of that passage I just told you about. Colossians chapter 1. Been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. Have been, past tense, transferred past tense. Like I said, they weren't even praying about that verse. They were just praying. And in the midst of it, all of a sudden, I realized I've been trying to get the victory when God has already given it to me. And that day, something deep inside of me changed. And when I walked out of that office, I started to think like I already have the victory. I started to talk like I already have the victory. I started to pray rather than God, please deliver me. God set me free. I started to thank God that he already won the victory. I started to walk like a victor rather than a victim. I'd love to tell you that meant right away everything was gone. That was not the reality. But in the face of this, I kept on standing in the fact that the victory has already been won. It's already mine. And I kept on taking the shield of faith and resisting the firing darts of the devil and kept on claiming the truth of God's word because 
every thought matters and every lie that came from the devil, I stood against in the name of Jesus and on the basis of God's word. And after about four months and probably about four of the guys are in this room today, I invited six elders to meet with me in that same room. I met with those guys in the spirit of James 1 that says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you be healed. And I confess to these elders the unbelief, the anxiety, the fear, the lust that had been filling my heart and the story of what has been happening and how I know I got the victory and I'm walking like that, but I'm still struggling. And these brothers prayed for me as victors in Christ. And that day, God set me free. He changed the battle, the intensity. Was, the back was broken. Does that mean I never have an anxious thought, a fearful thought, you know, an unbelieving thought, a lust? I'm not saying that, but you know what, guys? That's not my basic disposition in Christ. Because of what happened that day, there's peace there's quiet in my mind. There used to be all kinds of noise that was going on constantly from these thoughts. The power of sin practically in my life was broken that day. It was done at the cross. It was applied by the Spirit to my life that day. And what I want to encourage you with is your future can start right now really can if you choose to take on the battlefield of your mind if you will start to believe that every thought really does matter if you recognize that the greatest asset to your growth is your mind and the greatest hindrance to your growth is your mind if you will set the, the goal of your heart and the desire of your heart this morning, and because I say every thought matters, that means start right now. Oh, yeah, there's something I can do later. No, every thought matters. The thoughts you have right now matter. The thought you're going to have as soon as this sermon's done matters. The thought you're going to have when you go to your car matters. Every thought matters. And guys, right now is the time to take on the battle. You want to have a mind that's shaped by God's word and controlled by God's spirit. And if you would bring every thought you have captive to the obedience of Christ, if you will begin to view yourself the way that God views you, if you'll begin to label yourself and your experience according to God's word and according to what Jesus has done and what he has promised, then you have the future of a victor rather than a victim. We're going to close in prayer this morning. We're just going to close with one song of invitation. But I want to say something before this invitation. I, I have some concerns. It's because we're church people. And that's what church people do is what I, I, we. You did hear the word we. So as I share this, this is my first concern. You can be a black belt in the knowledge of God's word. But if you're a white belt and applying it, you've got a foundation that's going to break. See, this is what we do as Christians. We go to church, we hear the word of God. We go to Bible studies, we hear the word of God. We go to have our quiet time, we hear the word of God. We kind of think like James 1 says, we're deceived and thinking, I'm okay because I heard the word. <laughs> what did Jesus say? The one who hears the word and acts upon it is a wise man who built his house upon the rock. But the fool is the one who hears the word and does not act on it. He'll be a foolish man and his house will be built upon the sand. And guess what? When the storms come and the winds burst against it, that house is going to fall and be great as its fall. And you know what we struggle with as Christians? We hear so much of the word of God, we think we're okay just because we know it. The reality is we're not okay until we apply it. And I'm so burdened and so concerned that there's so many people here today that'll hear this and agree with it and never put it into practice. Nothing about your present or future will change 
without putting it in practice. Here's another thing. I want to say this respectfully and hopefully you'll catch my heart. There's a lot of people who think their thoughts aren't that bad, even though they know they're not right and good. Let me give you an example. We all know lust is bad. That's, that's one of the real biggies. Oh, man, the guy lust. He's a bad guy. That's a bad thought. We even think, oh, man, I shouldn't be thinking like that. That's bad. There's an epidemic of anxiety going on among believers, and they never take a thought of it as being bad. You know what happens? Person is struggling with lust. He's going to be holding, call somebody. I got, you got to help me hold accountable. You got to do these lists. I'm going to go to celebrate recovery. I got to do something to do this because we recognize how serious and damaging and destructive those thoughts are. You following me? But anxiety, ah, that's not bad. That's a pretty sin. It's not a big, ugly sin. But you know what? Anxiety is destructive. It steals sleep, it steals vitality, it steals joy, it steals focus. The list goes on and on. And you know what, guys? We think, no big deal. What do I got to worry about my thoughts for? I'm not that bad. Of a I'm not lusting like that guy over there. Guys, we got to understand whether it's our to-do list that's controlling us, whether it's our financial situations, whatever it is, we need to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus because every thought really does matter if we want to win this battle. And then I'm going to say the words of my good brother Jeff over here. Jeff, I didn't know you'd be here today. I know so many times you're ministering at other church. We're honored to have you when you're here. I won't say it like you do, but you'll catch the difference. You can either save your face or save your butt. You can imagine what the difference is. <laughs> Guys, you know what I'm concerned about? We are so worried about what other people think. And I would rather save my face than to come down to the front and humble myself before God and some other people like I had to do with the others. Say, you know what, guys? I'm struggling. I don't care what you think. I don't care what anybody else thinks. I need help. I need Jesus to move. I need him to do something right now. But you know what my concern is? Not just at Marine, but so many churches. We are so concerned about what other people think that we're going to save our face by not coming forward to pray rather than save our butts and saving our lives by humbling ourselves before God and man and confessing, I need Jesus. I need him to help me. And I'm hoping today that at Moraine Valley, we can stop trying to save face and save our butts. Because you know what, guys? If every person in this room started to recognize that every thought mattered, and we started to take every thought captive the obedience of Jesus, look out, south side of Chicago, look out, world. Because the life of Jesus will flow through this place like they've never seen before. And I'll finish you with this thought. Today's the day to take on your thoughts, guys. Matter of fact, not today, right now. Right now. And as Mary Welchel says, think about what you're thinking about. We never think about what we think about. It's time to think about what you're thinking about and bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So I'm going to ask the people who are going to be praying this morning, I'm going to invite the staff, if we see more people coming up, because I'm hoping today we can forget about saving our face and look at saving our souls. And you may need to come forward today and say, I need help. I need Jesus. And I'm hoping that, it, that the people up here won't be enough staff. Come on up and join us if you see that's needed. And we want to be here just to pray for you like for me, and say, Jesus, come in this person's life and touch him. So, Father, I, I've said what I've said. My heart today is that people won't worry about what others think or what they look like. But, God, today's the day to say, Jesus, I need you. 
I'm going to humble myself like in the crowds when Jesus was walking by. And that woman who had the issue of blood didn't care what anybody thought. She knew was, this is the only one that can help me. I've tried all kinds of other ones. Only Jesus, if I just touch the hem of his garment. And God, I pray this morning that you would give us that ability in this place to have the freedom and the desire to take on our thoughts today and begin to recognize that every thought matters in our life and that we would bring every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus. It's in his name I pray. Amen.